Joining us in our newsroom, we have Dr. David Nunley. Great to have you here. And please introduce yourself to our audiences. Um, good evening. I'm David Nunley. I'm the medical director of the lung transplant program at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, so we are talking lung transplants in the time of, of COVID. Um, and I understand that you've had a lot of success in this area. So can you talk about first um, the center and the types of um, the, tra the, the, su the successes that you guys have been having um, at the center? Well, the, uh, the Ohio State uh, Wexner Medical Center is a very prolific uh, transplant center. Uh, and speaking of lungs, we're one of the top 10 uh, programs in the country in terms of volume of transplants uh, performed uh, with uh, exceptional uh, survival uh, rates for our recipients. The uh, recent COVID pandemic has certainly added a new uh, slant to our work uh, in that uh, many patients who cannot recover from the lung injury from COVID find themselves in uh, need for a potential uh, lung transplant. Um, and especially with this second surge that's happened uh, since the fall, we've had over 20 uh, referrals for uh, patients um, who are either um, on a mechanical ventilator or requiring continual high flow oxygen who cannot be liberated from that level of support. And uh, their hospitals have often reached out to us to ask if uh, lung transplant would be an option. Unfortunately, not every patient can qualify for transplant, but uh, we certainly evaluate everyone very carefully and uh, have to date been able to perform five uh, transplants for uh, COVID related uh, injuries, while we have another three or four patients currently being uh, considered for transplantation. Mm -hmm. And just circling back, what not everybody does qualify for a lung transplant. It has to be sort of so severe that they, they get to that place where they need one. So what, can you just talk uh, briefly about how someone qualifies or is it differ depending on the patient or well, is there every, a marker? Every person has to be considered um, um, individually, of course, but uh, with this uh, COVID pandemic and the severe lung injury that can occur, one of the challenges we have is knowing when that lung disease is so advanced that it's unlikely to be reversible. Uh, typically, if we see significant scarring in the lung tissue, that usually has been the trigger for us to consider transplantation at that time. There may be reasons why someone may not qualify for a transplant. We know that people who have other um, uh, medical problems, especially advanced kidney disease or advanced heart disease, may not benefit from transplantation. Um, so again, all those cases have to be looked at individually. Mm -hmm. And so what about, um, I know that you were talking about the pandemic has certainly uh, contributed to the rise in, in lung transplants. Um, what, what are sort of complexities that you're, you're finding? I mean, are some people sort of hesitant to come in because of of uh, fear of contracting COVID or, or these things that, I mean, cause we've seen a lot, of, a lot of sort of medical procedures be put off because people are fearful of going to a, a hospital or something to, uh, because of that fear. Well, um, like most hospitals in the United States, uh, back in the spring of uh, 2019, I think all programs here, uh, including lung transplant, um, uh, scaled down because of concerns about a, a risk to not only the, the healthcare workers in the hospital, but also patients or other people coming into the hospital who may not need urgent hospitalization. Um, I think when the COVID cases kind of uh, died off in the summer, and of course they never went totally away, but uh, those enterprises um, um, re-engaged and kicked back into to high gear. Um, with the second surge, we pretty much decided that there were so many patients out there that could potentially benefit from our services that we did not scale down during the second uh, surge. And I think, uh, again, that has allowed us to uh, consider these patients uh, who may be in need for transplantation. So certainly that um, added a level of complexity that, that was a learning curve for all of us to figure out how to be able to continue to offer this during this, uh, this time. Um, Okay. Yeah, no, no, uh, that's really interesting. I just wanted to move on um, to our next question, which was something um, about six weeks ago, we had a, uh, there was a study that came out that a woman unknowingly received a lung transplant and she became infected with the 
coronavirus uh, because the donor had COVID-19. And I understand that we're doing better with testing, but how do we how do we test someone who has has passed? Um, how do, how do we know that? How do we do that? Like, how, do you do you have any sense of why that happened? Well, when when uh, testing became uh, more widely available uh, late last uh, spring, early summer, uh, certainly all uh, donors were tested at their donor hospitals uh, at least on two occasions to ensure that they were not. Uh, infected. As you know, there are several types of tests for coronavirus, some that are rapid, uh, some that are take longer but are more uh, specific for identifying the disease. So all donors now are screened. In the case in Michigan, I, I'm, I don't have privileged information really on that case. However, like all medical tests, there is always an er a, a margin of error in any test. I would suspect if that donor was tested and probably had a false negative result. But again, I don't have inside information. Of course. That. But that's that's a very, very uncommon and, and rare occurrence. Exactly. And you were speaking about testing and that there's still sort of this lag and we have these rapid tests, but right, about 40% in the one to two days after we get a test, we get a, a false negative, at least are the, those are the statistics that I've recently read. And then 20% um, after, you know, within four days. So would you recommend moving forward? And I know you, you've had much success in the way that you have been doing this, um, but in terms of testing and transplantation, what do you think should people, I mean, because you have to get that lung in there very quickly. Uh, so it's sort of weighing two things. Yes, it's um, once a, an organ is procured from a donor, the clock essentially is ticking. You, you want to try to do that implantation of that lung and that recipient within, ideally within four to six hours. And of course that leaves you very little uh, time to uh, do confirmatory uh, testing. So right now, the, what we have is kind of the state of the art in terms of, of, of doing the testing. Now, some donors, um, you know, they will be at their donor hospital maybe for a couple of days before the, um, um, the procurement is done. And therefore you may have a little bit more opportunity in those individuals. Um, could you say that last part again? I just- No, I said, you know, most, when a donor is becomes available, um, it, it takes some time to allocate all the organs that they may be providing. So some people, are, are, are organ donors only for um, maybe 24 hours before the donor, the, before the surgery occurs and others may be longer. Obviously the patients who are uh, taking longer to do the allocation of their of the organs, mm -hmm. um, there may be more longer opportunities and more time to um, uh, secure their testing. Okay, okay. Uh, that's, um, that's really interesting. And especially the way you put it, the way in which um, the medical center uh, the comprehensive transplant center you guys have a, at the Ohio State University. Um, so uh, last last 30 seconds, um, we're almost out of time. What would you like to say about, I, well, I've heard doctors say, get that this is, this case was very rare, but when you have an uh, opportunity to get the transplant, get the transplant. Now, obviously um, we would like everyone to be vaccinated and, and not to have this, this problem, if at all possible, but we're glad that we can provide this uh, service uh, for those who are in need. I think um, uh, the message that I would give uh, providers is that if you have someone in the ICU and um, um, they're not progressing, at least think of transplant as an option. It doesn't hurt to call and, and discuss the possibility. Uh, I'd also like to make uh, everyone know that this is, this is an effort of a great team. It's not just a, a surgeon or a pulmonologist. It, it really takes uh, nurse coordinators, pharmacists, social workers, everyone to pull this off and make it work. Uh, so, um, and then of course, always we couldn't do any of this work unless patients or people and families uh, didn't choose to give the donation. So that is always important. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us today and all of the congratulations on all your success and what you're doing in, in, uh, during this time and uh, moving forward. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your interest.